This is a Chinese vessel blinding a Filipino fisherman using lasers in Philippine territory. Earlier, a big Chinese ship purposely collided with a Philippine Coast Guard vessel. It's not just Philippines. China has regularly and aggressively sent fighter jets into Taiwan territory and fired missiles over Taiwanese island. A Chinese warship cut across the bow of an American-guided missile destroyer transiting the Taiwan Strait. China has also sent ships and jets in Malaysia and Indonesian waters to harass the oil drilling operation in both countries' territories. This continuing and growing bullying by China has forced many nations to turn to the USA. In an effort to stop the Chinese advance, the US military has come up with a new strategy. A strategy to surround China and be ready to fight in case there's ever a major escalation. This strategy is the US plan to not only help smaller nations, but also stop CCP from exerting its influence over international waters. So in today's video, let's talk about the US's new strategy to trap China and how it will cement the world order. Before jumping in, we have a quick rant about the state of today's news organizations. News companies are just focused on being divisive and enraging. That's because that's what gets the engagement, which gets more eyeballs, which means more money. We're not gonna lie, Regular viewers of the channel know that sometimes we have taken clickbaits a bit too far just to get you guys to watch the video. That's the problem with news that is served by an algorithm. We put tens if not one hundreds of hours into making a video, covering important news, but at the end of the day, if we can't convince you to click, all the effort is wasted. This phenomenon is far worse than the news companies, who have special positions just to get clicks on their news. These experts have figured out that the best way to get clicks is to scare the public, focus on negative stories, and blow every event out of proportion. But that's not what news is supposed to be. That's why we launched Global Recaps. Every weekday, an email is sent directly to your inbox. In it, we cover the world's most important news in a short and concise manner, with links to read more if you're interested in any specific news. We also take the most important news story and break it down in simple terms to explain how it affects you and everyone else. These emails take less than five minutes to read, and they make you more informed about the world you live in, about the good, the bad, and the neutral. They are meant to keep you informed, not scare you. If you think these emails can be helpful to you, then you can sign up now by scanning the QR code on screen or clicking the link in the description. Now let's get back to the basics. Before jumping into the US's plan, let's quickly go over why China is willing to fight so many countries over the South China Sea. The South China Sea is a marginal sea in the Pacific Ocean bounded by South China, the Philippines, Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia, and Indonesia. This region is believed to have around 28 billion barrels of oil reserves, 266 trillion cubic feet of natural gas, and holds one third of the entire world's marine biodiversity, thereby making it a very important area for the ecosystem, even if fish stocks in the area are rapidly depleting. If all these weren't reason enough, the South China Sea is a very important trade route, and as of 2019, around 3.37 trillion USD worth of global trade passes through this region annually. The main route to and from the Pacific and Indian Ocean ports is through the Strait of Malacca and the South China Sea. Generally, oil and minerals move north, and food and manufactured goods move south. As we have covered in our previous videos, China is heavily dependent on oil imports to fuel its economy and its industries. Roughly 50% of Chinese oil imports come from the Middle East, and that oil sails through the South China Sea. And as you guys have already heard the last 1,000 times we've said it, China is the world's manufacturing hub, and its economic growth is fueled by selling those manufactured goods to the rest of the world. A big part of China's exports flow through the South China Sea to the rest of the world, so we're sure you guys can see that the South China Sea is very important to China. But does that mean it belongs to China? Um, we're not quite sure. Let's look at China's supposed claim to this area in just a sec. But first, let's go over the international law that defines who controls what part of the ocean. Just a quick reminder to hit the like button to help out the video against the CCP bots. Coming back to the topic, according to the law of the sea, that was signed in UN Convention in 1982. Each country's sovereign territorial waters extend to a maximum of 12 nautical miles, 22 kilometers, beyond its coast. But foreign vessels are granted the right of innocent passage through this zone. Beyond its territorial waters, every coastal country may establish an exclusive economic zone, EEZ, extending 200 nautical miles, 370 kilometers from shore. Now, remember this, as this will become really important later in the video. 
Within the EEZ, the coastal state has the right to exploit and regulate fisheries, construct artificial islands and installations, and use the zones for other economic purposes. Now, every country recognizes this law, including China. This is actually how every country has claimed their part of the South China Sea, 200 nautical miles from their coast, every country but China. There are some overlaps in Vietnamese, Malaysian, Brunus, and Filipino claims, but no one is talking much about that because, well, all these countries are united together against China's claim. You see, when it comes to this part of the sea, China doesn't want to follow the law of the sea. No, no, no. In fact, China wants to follow this made-up nine-dash line to exert its claim. This nine-dash line covers almost 90% of the South China Sea, and the CCP claims that it's all part of China. Now, you may ask, what's the reasoning behind the nine-dash line, since there are no laws or anything that mentions this? Well, according to the CCP's reasoning, a Chinese explorer discovered the South China Sea, so therefore, it belongs to China. We guess by the same reasoning, China belongs to Italy because Marco Polo discovered China. Time for CCP to pack up and hand over the reins to the Italians. Jokes aside, that is the reasoning the CCP has used to claim pretty much the whole South China Sea, and it has led to some very confrontational situations with other countries. Fresh tensions over a long-standing dispute. A renewed war of words between China and the Philippines today. We're now being surrounded by Chinese vessels. They've sailed really, really close to us, as close as a few meters from us. As territorial disputes in the South China Sea continue. Excessive and offensive, the Chinese Coast Guard appears to block the supply boat's path. How are you? To leave this area immediately, any consequences in China format will be brought by you. To assert their claim, several countries in the conflict officially renamed the region that they claimed. In September 2012, the Philippine president signed an administrative order maintaining that all government agencies use the same West Philippine Sea to refer to the parts of the South China Sea within the Philippines. Similarly, in 2017, Indonesia renamed the northern reaches of its exclusive economic zone in the South China Sea as the North Natuna Sea in an attempt to assert its sovereignty. All while this is happening, the CCP starts building its own island in the South China Sea. Not just any islands, military islands. They were home to few military personnel, an airstrip, and a missile system. Based on international law, these islands were within the Philippines' border, so the Philippines decided to take China to UN court. In 2016, a ruling from the Hague ruled in favor of the Philippines, claiming China had indeed encroached their land, a ruling that the CCP chose to ignore and has not put into effect yet. To make matters worse, the CCP declared the airspace above the disputed land to be a defensive air identification zone, and issued a notice that aircraft flying through it would need Chinese permission. This move, while they claim will only be enforced in defense, has further strained relations between the countries. On top of this, there was a second part of this ruling that was just as important to the whole conflict. You guys remember earlier how we said that according to the law of the sea, 200 nautical miles from the coast is each country's exclusive economic zone? Well, so there are a group of islands in the middle of the South China Sea, called the Spratly Islands, that all the countries are trying to claim. The main reason being that if you can establish a claim on the island, you can extend your EEZ and control more of the South China Sea. But according to a 2016 ruling, the Spratly Islands were ruled a rock, so it doesn't extend any country's EEZ. This kind of killed the importance of the islands, but that doesn't mean conflict calmed down. China has been using something called the Cabbage Strategy, or the Salami Slicing Strategy, to choke out supplies to foreign lands. To accomplish this, China will surround a foreign-controlled islands with its ships and destroyers to deny access to rival nations and then try to subsequently claim the islands. Now, of course, the United States has a lot of allies in this conflict, and we have the strongest navy in the world. One important part that the US Navy plays is maintaining peace at sea, so world trade can continue without interruption. So since China was being so aggressive in the South China Sea, the US Navy has increased its presence there to keep peace. This is where the new US military plan starts. In fact, this was a plan that started soon after the end of World War II. To counter the Soviet Union and Communist China's maritime ambitions, the United States crafted the island chain strategy. As the Soviet Union collapsed and Communist China grew, a similar strategy has been used to contain China. Two island chains in the Western Pacific are noteworthy. The first comprises the Kuril Islands, the main Japanese archipelago, Okinawa, the northern part of the Philippine archipelagos, the Malay Peninsula, and Taiwan. The second chain consists of the islands of Japan stretching to Guam and the islands of Micronesia. 
America was able to set up bases or form partnerships with countries to solve its biggest hurdle. The US military had a problem in the Western Pacific, the tyranny of distance and time. Delivering military force across the vast Pacific Ocean has never been easy, even for a country as blessed in resources and ingenuity as the United States. If the Chinese army were to launch a rapid attack, it would be able to move a lot faster than the American Navy could respond if it weren't for the island chain. American forces located outside the conflict area would have to penetrate China's anti-access area denial, A2AD, network to restore the status quo that was there beforehand. A daunting proposition. Under these circumstances, Washington might face the unenviable choice of doing nothing or escalating to higher levels of violence. Either way, the national interests of both the United States and its closest allies would suffer dramatically. This is where the first island chain strategy was very helpful in stationing American troops and weapons near the possible battle zone. The main goal of being so close to China is twofold. First, by being ready to defend the area from Chinese aggression, the USA strategic forces are hoping to deter China from launching an assault in the first place. But this strategy only holds true as long as China believes that the US Navy can defeat it. History shows that deterrence is more likely to fail when an aggressor believes it can pull off an attack successfully. If Chinese leadership believes it can achieve gains through aggression quickly and without paying steep costs in blood, money, and reputation, it may be tempted to escalate a crisis to open conflict. This is where island chains are not only set up as a way to support allies, but also as a way to blockade the Chinese inside in case of an assault. As covered earlier, China is a big importer of oil. In fact, China imports almost double the amount of oil that the USA does, and the majority of that oil flows from the Middle East, which is transported through the Indian Ocean. All this oil passes through what some might consider one of the most important geopolitical choke points, here in the Strait of Malacca. It's projected that 80% of China's oil flows through this strait. This strait is the territorial waters of Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore. This strait is a very big weakness for China. In case of any war or political disagreement, this strait could easily be blocked off by enemies, like India or the USA. Without access to this route, it's very hard for China to get energy to fuel its economy, let alone a war. In today's world, oil is the lifeblood of the economy and its government. The CCP can only survive for so many days with a mostly halted economy. That's why, as China's economy grew, the CCP became more aware of its shortcomings and invested heavily in improving its military and navy to avoid getting in the situation where another country controlled the sea routes that China depended on. CCP realized that to become the dominant power in Asia, China must first become the preeminent power in the first island chain. According to the U.S. Department of Defense's Military and Security Developments involving the People's Republic of China 2019 report, China has been establishing communication, aviation and port facilities, fixed weapon positions, and barracks in the Spratly Islands since 2018. Developing a strong and permanent military presence in the first island chain will give China control of the major shipping routes in Asia and help in establishing itself as a dominant global power. The Chinese Coast Guard CCG, frequently harasses fishing and survey vessels of other claimant states in the South China Sea. In 2020, a Chinese warship laser-tagged a Philippine Navy ship. A Chinese survey vessel, Haiyong DZ-8, illegally entered Malaysia's maritime exclusive economic zone and tailed a Malaysian state-owned oil company's contracted ship. On the 22nd of May 2020, Beijing announced an $178.2 billion military budget, an increase of 6.6% 6 .6 from 2019. Also in May, the CCG harassed Japanese fishing vessels in the Daiyu Senkaku Islands. The militarization of contested islands and harassment of foreign vessels from Daiyu Senkaku down to the Malay Peninsula exposes China's intention and strategy to control the first island chain. On top of overpowering the first island chain, CCP is also trying to build infrastructure and the world to overcome this obstacle. Many experts have pointed out that CCP's flagship belt and road initiative is a way of making sure that China has reduced its dependency on the Pacific Ocean routes. China has built pipelines both in Myanmar and Pakistan, from the coast to inner city China. It secured long port leases in Pakistan and Sri Lanka. Similarly, China has also set up a military base in Djibouti to control Bab el Mandeb, a vital strait off the coast of Djibouti that links the Red Sea to the Indian Ocean. Persian Gulf and Asian exports bound for Western markets must first pass through Bab el Mandeb before reaching the Suez Canal. Between 12.5 and 20% of all global trade passes through this strait. Only eight miles from China's base is Camp Lemonire. As China got stronger, it made moves to set itself free of the island chain. 
This left many Pacific Ocean countries worried that China is preparing for increased aggression and bullying near Taiwan and South China Sea. It's not just the first island chain that China is targeting, it's also building up strength to overcome the second island chain in the middle of the Pacific. Just a reminder, the second chain consists of the islands of Japan stretching to Guam and the islands of Micronesia. China's presence in the second island chain would give Beijing control of the middle of the Pacific, which serves as a strategic military and economic outpost. The U.S.'s withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership in 2017 has emboldened China to fill the vacuum of influence in the Western Pacific. In September 2019, China's economic support for the Solomon Islands led the Pacific state to switch its diplomatic recognition of Taiwan to China. Soon after, Kiribati followed suit. In December 2019, China vowed to provide economic assistance for infrastructure development to Micronesia. Notably, Micronesia could serve as a strategic location for China to counter American military presence in Guam. However, the U.S. has agreements with Micronesia, Palau, and the Marshall Islands, the Compacts of Free Association, which gives the U.S. exclusive access to the land, sea, and air routes of these island states. Although China courts the Pacific Islands with promises of economic investments, they are still traditionally tied to the U.S. This fact adds difficulty for China, as a military presence without a strategic basing to penetrate the second island chain will be hard to achieve. But coming back to the South China Sea, China's actions have left the USA with two choices, either strengthen the first island chain to gain back the advantage in deterrence strategy, or ditch protecting American allies in the Pacific Ocean. So obviously, America has stepped its efforts to reinforce the first island chain to safeguard its allies' interests. Just this year, the U.S. Marine Corps marked the opening of a new base on America's westernmost Pacific island, Guam. This will be the first new Marine base since 1952, and will house 5,000 Marines charged in the short term with deterring and detecting threats in the region. Longer term, the Guam base, almost equidistant from Japan and Taiwan, is also stated to be a hub for Marines on Guam and across the northern Mariana Islands to train for protecting Pacific islands, including vital sea lanes, in the event of an invasion. If there is a conflict with China, the Marines would be among the first ground forces to respond. Around the same time, the USA reached an agreement with the Philippines that gives the US access to four military camps in the country. Even though this doesn't give US military permanent bases there, it does give US troops, rotating in and out of the Philippines, a bird's eye view of two critical spots, the Taiwan Strait and disputed regions of the South China Sea. There are about 500 U.S. troops in the Philippines on any given day, but thousands rotate in and out over the course of a year for military exercises, humanitarian aid, training, and other missions, according to officials. The Philippines allow American forces to stay in barracks within designated Philippine camps. The U.S. already had access to five Philippine military bases. On top of this, the U.S. would also increase its deployment of advanced military assets to the Korean Peninsula, including fighter jets and aircraft carriers to boost joint training and planning. Additionally, U.S. and Japan agreed to adjust the American troop presence on the island of Okinawa in part to enhance anti-ship capabilities that would be needed in the event of a Chinese incursion into Taiwan or other hostile acts in the South or East China Sea. They also added a formal mention of outer space in the long-standing U.S.-Japan Security Treaty, making clear that attacks to, from, and within space could trigger the mutual defense provisions of the treaty. And Japan announced it would begin constructing a pair of runways on the small southern island of Mangashima, where joint exercises, amphibious operations, and missile interception could begin in about four years. The island would be a hub for troop deployments and munition supplies in case of a conflict like a Taiwan emergency. The changes in the U.S. deployment on Okinawa will transform the 12th Marine Regiment into a smaller, more rapidly mobile unit. The 12th Marine Littoral Regiment, which will be better equipped to fight an adversary and defend the U.S. and its allies in the region. The U.S. is doing everything in its power to send the signal that if there's any aggression near the South China Sea, it will be far more of a guaranteed win for China. Goal of all this is deterrence by denial. The U.S. has also been busy diplomatically. The U.S. opened an embassy in the Solomon Islands this year in a direct effort to counter China's growing influence there. There had been an embassy in the Solomons for several years, but it was closed in 1993 as part of a global reduction in diplomatic posts. Over time, however, the U.S. became concerned about possible weakening ties with the country. The Solomon Islands switched allegiance from the self-ruled island of Taiwan to Beijing in 2019, and last year, the Solomons signed a security pact with China, raising fears of a military buildup by Beijing in the region. Reopening an embassy there, the U.S. State Department said, was a priority to counter China's growing influence in the region. The embassy in the capital, Honiara, is starting small, 
with a charge de affaires, a couple of State Department staff, and a handful of local employees. Just to add insult to injury, India has also started its strategy to encircle China and contain China's growing influence. After seeing all the moves China has been making, a lot of military experts have pointed out that the Belt and Road is not just a geoeconomic plan, it also has a military strategic advantage. The ports have increasingly come to play a potentially more menacing role as dual-use ports that can give the strengthened Chinese Navy a global reach it lacked entirely just a few years ago. These strategic investments are nicknamed the String of Pearls, as the goal is to encircle India and put pressure on New Delhi. India was aware of this already, but the war in Ukraine showed every country in the world how important it is to secure your economic interests. In the modern world, wars can be won and lost before even stepping a foot on the battlefield. India realized that, in the case of a war, China's string of pearls can be used as a way to choke off India's access to the world, on top of safeguarding Chinese interests. Adding to this, countries that received Chinese money were slow to criticize China whenever it would start skirmishes on the disputed border with India like it did in 2017 and 2020. There's also a rumor that China plans to start setting up military bases in countries that receive Chinese loans. And of course, this was undoubtedly stressful for New Delhi, as it didn't want to be surrounded by the Chinese military. So, India started laying out its own plan to safeguard its economic interests, but it didn't just stop there. Later in the video, we will go over how India is taking advantage of China's trade war with the USA to hurt China where it's the strongest, its manufacturing prowess. But first, let's go over how India is countering China's military. To counter the string of pearls, India started its own alliances to encircle China, nicknamed the Necklace of Diamonds. India is expanding its naval bases and is also improving relations with strategically placed countries to counter China's strategies. In 2018, India partnered with Singapore and Indonesia to get access to their naval bases of Changi and Sabang. This increased India's influence and access to the Strait of Malacca, one of the most important choke points for China and the rest of the world in terms of trade. That same year, India also got military access to the port of Dukam in Oman. The port facilitates India's crude imports from the Corrosion Gulf. In addition to this, the Indian facility is located right between two important Chinese pearls, Djibouti in Africa and Gwadar in Pakistan. India has also signed an agreement with Seychelles for a naval base in the region, which will increase India's presence near the African continent. While doing this, India has also extended credit lines to Iran, and agreed to build a port in the country to extend access to trade routes in Central Asia. Additionally, India has extended credit lines in Central Asia to countries like Mongolia, where Modi has agreed to develop a bilateral air corridor. New Delhi has invested a lot in policies to improve relationships with Japan and Vietnam. These relationships have helped increase Indian trade and consequently India's influence on countries around China.